She's been working for 25 years in indigenous um, traditions, bringing soul healing to the 21st century. Sarah blends her Celtic background and her study with native populations uh, into a course that works with true healing in accordance with Herring's Law. Again, without further ado, Sarah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> very, very happy to be here. It's always a welcoming thing to realize that we, in this moment, have all chosen to be together. And that is always a real opening place to begin. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background that is relevant to the talk today because um, my way of learning and my way of being in the world has always been that I absorb everything that's around me and I learn from environment and I learn from hanging out with people, not necessarily by reading books or direct instruction. For instance, my mother was a ballerina and a, a quite a well-known in England ballet dancer and um, I learned how to dance and to teach and to do this, not so much by direct instruction, but by being raised in a household with her there. And it's really, some of us learn very, very well by what I would call osmosis. And it's nothing we can explain in black and white, yet it's there. I was the one in, in math class who could find the answer but had no idea about how to lay out how I got there. <laughs> Maybe I sound familiar to some of you, and maybe not. But so in my later years, I've actually had to try and find my way out of intuitively knowing and intuitively being in the right place at the right time, engaging in debate and conversation with fabulous people. I've had, through teaching, I've been asked to arrive inside of myself some kind of trail to how this knowledge arrives and this wisdom arises, not just within me, but within all of us. So, I happened to grow up in Cambridge, England, uh, right after the Second World War. And I had the huge opportunity and grace and chance to be raised in, uh, within the University of Cambridge, which my father was an architect and my mother, as I said, was a ballerina. And next door lived family whose father was a physicist. And as a child, I merged in between the arts and the science without being able to articulate anything. But Dr. Bowden, who lived next door, was very much involved in a lot of the post-war phys phys physical physicists, um, the colleges at Cambridge and with the Cavendish lab. He was a knighted, recognized scientist by the queen. So that was the household next door. And as I said, I learned by osmosis. And so I grew up from the early days of black holes, a very early discovery of them, and exploration by Riley and Bowden. And um, without really knowing one articulation of what that is, it has always driven a fascination within me. My early spiritual education was, um, was actually my godmother. And my godmother studied with Steiner in Germany and Switzerland. So again, it's my very first spiritual teacher had a strong connection to understanding the world that we live in, in physical terms, as well as all the other ways. Um, so those were, those were kind of like my early introduction to a more scientific explanation of what life is and why I've always loved the two worlds. I'm here to say I'm not a physicist, I'm not a scientist, and neither am I a shaman. That term has been very sort of banded around. I've certainly encountered and had conversation and spent time with both scientists and shamans. And I've I explained the way that I learn, so that should tell you there's something that informs me at that time that I cannot always articulate, but leads me into a direction and leads me into uh, information arising within me that has been stimulated by the presence that I'm in. There is a huge amount of connection around energy and energy medicine, which I'm sure, by the fact that you're in Bastyr, 
you are already embracing as part of your own perception of how the world is. Um, and at this moment in time, we are literally on that verging horizon of falling into a very new way of understanding and being in the world. And that is because the scientists are coming up with an explanation of how something is in a way that certainly my elders and all of the elders before that have been articulating for thousands and thousands of years. And that is, we are all one, right? <laughs> the classic phrase. Um, and um, the person, if, if, if this kind of work really stimulates you, you, you leave, you, you come out of here going, I want to know more. The physicist I suggest that you look at right now is Nassim Haramein. N-A-S, uh, someone could write it up in the board. I could, but where's the pen? Make sure I get the spelling right for you. Nassim. I'm so clever with the name right guys. Um, in that he speaks in language in a way that you're that you're going to understand, and he's not all math equations, though that is also part of who he of what he is. And he's had awards, and he's accepted somewhat by the standard scientific community. Okay, let's look at the world of science. The world of the science is the one that we grew up in, right? We went to school, we learned things. And they had to be proven. They had to be a fact, otherwise they were dismissed, disregarded, and taken off the table. Some of you are much younger than me in here, so I don't know if education's changed, but I listen to my grandchildren, and I'm not so sure it has. Um, okay, so in 1890, the, they hypothesized that, um, that we were all connected and we were all one, and they started trying experiments at that time to prove that. But in 1890, there wasn't the equipment to be able to measure such a fine detail, and so they had to let it go. And I'm talking about the proton experiment, where the proton was sent out in the end of the 90s, I believe it was, uh, in separate directions. And when one, they split the proton, goes in separate directions, 17 miles in each direction, very expensive project. Um, and they, the, this proton was informed differently, or was informed something here. They both were informed simultaneously. There was no space, there was no time. Everything was happening together, even though there was two 17s, 34 miles apart. Okay, so that wasn't, that did not, when they tried that in the 1890s, because they kind of assumed that it was true, but they couldn't prove it because of their measuring instruments. We then went into a century of thinking that that was not so, that we were separate, we were individuals. What someone did here had no effect on someone over here. No act of creation over here had anything to do with this one over here. And that should begin to give you the kind of environment that you were educated in. And that's all it was. It was just a, an idea educated. There was a time when the world was flat, right? And then the hypothesis was proved over a, then a long period of time that of course it was round, or at least that's what we accepted it. That flat to round took several hundred years for it to permeate and change how everyone saw the world. There wasn't the communication, there wasn't the information, there wasn't anything like that at that time, so things happened slower, according to how we see time now. But today, something changes, it's out into, through internet and various other ways, and becomes a very fast and rapid change amongst all of us. And what is it that's changing? It's not our physical bodies, right? It's our consciousness, the way that we are understanding ourselves in relation to everything. So, this place 
this place of wondering, this place of questioning, this place of change, this place of moving and changing consciousness is a very key part of really understanding who we are. If you take a moment within yourselves to know that as you close your eyes, there is a sense of yourself that is so much bigger than your actual body. And that's what I'm referring to right now as consciousness. Our consciousness has the capacity for everything. It doesn't just belong to us, it's flowing through us all the time. And that's the part that science is beginning to have a definition from. And in fact, this word here was used for this talk because we would all understand roughly what I was talking about. But do you know that science has now said maybe that's not working? And they've replaced it with this word. Vacuum. And I'm going to assume that you're all involved in the healing practices here or learning or developing yourselves in that way. So this word actually becomes really, really an important part of where we're all going together and also where healing comes from. Where change really occurs. Where we have the capacity and the ability to actually evolve and move our consciousness into a whole other way of seeing. In the spiritual world, we're talking about a new world, a new vision, a way to see and dream the world into a new place. A place that is sustainable, a place that makes sense to us as we are right now, a place of cooperation, a place of where we work as one world family together to arrive wherever we need to go. In health and healing, this is the place that you want your client to arrive in and yourself to be in. Okay, and let's talk a little bit more. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it from the scientific term. And I said, for, for understanding this in layman's terms, this is your guy. <clears throat> what is now being said is that within I'm going to take you through an experience of it. That's easy. Okay. So if you're game, you want to play with me, just shut your eyes and just come center into the room. Take a deep breath and let it out. Relaxing, dropping away from the world outside. And I'm asking you as you center in, side of yourself, bringing your presence, your consciousness, and your awareness inside your body. I want you to examine and to look and to see the infinite bodies of cells that are running around. See your body as a community of cells, each with a purpose, each with direction, busy, active, moving and see your body as a myriad of dots cells and then as you sit in this community of cells being become one of those cells by focusing on just one of those cells. You get it bigger and bigger and bigger until you find yourself inside the cell. And while you're inside the cell, take a look around. And as you focus inside that cell on everything that's around and 
you look at the mechanism of the cell, you see that it's made of tiny, tiny, tiny circles and dots. In fact, the whole cell is a teeming, teeming ocean of atoms. And I want you to really focus on those atoms. And on one in particular, and become that atom. And get it bigger and bigger and bigger until you find yourself inside the atom. And as you're inside the atom, you will find at the center, the nucleus of it, a dot. A proton. And I want you to ask you to just merge with that proton. Feel the deep sense of stillness inside the center of the proton. Be there a while. Be in its peace. Experience the light. Experience the stillness. You just know that right now you're at the source of the vacuum, the source of life, the source of all being. Some have the experience of seeing an eye in here, the eye of your creator. <clears throat> And as a proton, and you look out and remember all the places, how is it now that you see space? How is it now that you see consciousness? How is it that you see yourself? So having had this proton touchstone, this place that connects and holds the same density of power and force as does the universe, accessible, available to you in each and every proton in your body, the millions and billions of infinite ways. Not outside, inside of you. Now I want you to slowly step back into the consciousness of the atom. And you may notice that the atom is dark and the proton you now pull away from and you see is light. sitting now in the atom. When you were proton, you were galactic. Now as an atom, you're sitting in the consciousness of knowing that however finite we look, however small we look, there is continuously something else. Repeating mathematics, fractal mathematics, on and on. This is the meaning of infinite. It never ends. Now 
Now as an atom, you are light. You are stardust. You are stone. You are the building foundation of physical world. And it is in here, as you look at yourself, the people, your life, and all that's around you, from the solar system, from the sun within yourself. For we all came from the sun. Millions and millions of atoms popping in and popping out, here one minute, gone the next. Present, not present. A place where you understand the atom that you are a being of light. And that you are constantly going in and out of a vacuum that informs you and receives you. A creator that breathes you in and breathes you out. A force, a power. Slowly, I'm asking you to come back into the world of the cell. Where life begins to take on more of a physical form and a way that you can begin to again see that which you physically know beginning to reappear physical shape, physical form. But remember, as you sit in that cell, the myriad, the, the night sky of stars, is still there. That place that you just came from. That place of the proton. Inside, millions of them inside the atom. Millions of atoms inside the cell. Each holding infinite wisdom, infinite power in the center. A force, an unknown amount of force and power within. Not just singularly, but in an infinite way. Inside of every cell. Now I want you to come back into the consciousness of seeing your body as a community of cells, lots of cells running around inside of you. Functioning, moving, on mission, knowing exactly where they are, changing in, changing out, reforming, remaking, recalibrating. What's informing them? It's not you. Could it be? But what's informing them is all of that information inside the center of a proton, the infinite universe. The mathematics for a proton are identical to the universe. This is not made up, this has been proven mathematically. It has been shown. And the ancient people have always told us, stop looking out there, for everything that's out there is inside you and infinitely more than you can see. So now I'm asking you to come back to being aware that you're sitting in the room someone maybe beside you, an awareness of the table, an awareness of your feet on the ground, this amazing physical body that holds all of this in shape and in form, and it may physically walk around the world in the way that we do, come present into the room. And as you 
Slouch, get really aware of your body, your feet, your hands, the top of your head, even scratch the top of your head if you need to. Feel your arms, squeeze them. It's important to come fully back into the room. Okay. Sweat Lodge is one of the oldest ceremonial forms in the world as we know it. Um, it's been used by many, many different cultures. And um, it is where um, it's a ceremony of purification. And um, what that is in how it takes form physically is that a small um, uh, small like kind of like hut is made of uh, uh, from from um, uh, saplings. Okay, and it makes a. Sorry. Um, and it's made with saplings, like so. That's a very rough kind of idea. And it's made small, it goes about this high, and then outside there's a fire, and stones are put on the high fire, and then heated till they're molten red hot. And then this is covered with, you know, it used to be hides, but now it's blankets, right? And the stones are brought inside here, and the people sit inside here, right? Stones are brought in, put in here. Thing is covered and closed. This is kind of like a doorway here. That's covered. And so you're inside a dark space with red hot stones in the middle. And you sing and you pray. And depending on the tradition, how many rounds are done. Um, you must have heard of saunas. Um, the sauna is kind of what, what happened to a lot of indigenous cultures is that folklore had to take over when they were really suppressed and their information wasn't wanted and they were dismissed for what they knew. The, um, then some of them managed to find ways within folk tradition to carry on. And so the sauna is very much that. But the original Samis in the uh, northern part of uh, Sweden and in through into Russia, northern parts of Russia, the tundra lands there, they made theirs out of whale bones. How cool is that? <laughs> that would be come up on the beach. Um, and those, re those still stay here. The Irish did it with uh, um, turf. So they use the materials. Indigenous people use the terrain and the landscape of where they are for everything, including their gods and the way that they see the world. But this is a very, very old ceremony of purification, because when you do that, you sweat a lot, right? And there are prayers and songs that most traditions have that they hold in there. Okay. You just did that exercise, right? So I wrote in 1990, before I knew any of this, a lot of, before the language of vacuum was here, quantum was hardly being mentioned. Okay, so we've come a long way in 20 years, all right, 25 years. You enter inside, this is what I was being taught, you enter inside the womb or the cell of your creator. And you pray and sing and become one heart and one mind. So you can enter the next world, the world of stone and stardust, the world of the atom. Okay, I'm putting that in parentheses, it's not what I wrote. The sun is inside those stones, which I'm saying is the sense, that, right? We went in. We sang and prayed, one heart, one mind, and then went to the next place, which was the, the world of what they call, this is indigenous, right? Their vocabulary is what they live in, just as science is our vocabulary today. There is no difference. So their terminology was stone and stardust. The stardust being inside the stones. And they said, it's the sun inside the stones, the light. Okay? The sun is inside those stones. You see here, and you ask permission of your creator, and enter the little round bubbles of sunlight. What they're talking about are the atoms that you can see when you're put into complete darkness like this, and all light is shut out. Then you actually begin to see. You you, you see this. You you see atoms, you see stars, however, however you want to um, describe it, but you can see a myriad of little tiny dots of light. 
Okay? And so, ask permission, for we are all from the sun, and we are all light here. Once we're in the atom, we are all light. Inside the, inside the light, you might see many little eyes, which are the protons. They talked about the physical eye, the eye of your creator. Okay? They look like they're watching you. Maybe they are watching, seeing if you can go through the doorway into the main, into the teepee. For in there lies true health and happiness. And that was the place we just all went in a different kind of, went to the same place. We didn't do it in ceremony and we didn't do it with this vocabulary. But I'm hoping you can begin to correlate. Because what I am sh talking about when I'm talking about being trained to do this, this is information that comes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Passed down, passed down, orally passed down if there wasn't a written language. For many of the indigenous people, they, can, they hold much wisdom because they have not had any, in, some of them have not had much interruption to the way that they have seen their life or lived their life. That's why they've sustained it. Western culture has sustained a lot of those early teachings through some more querulous forms, like the Templars through, um, Western mysticism has its own history where it has been very much um, deviated in many, many instances because of the power that exists within the center of the proton. Where there is a vacuum, right, nothing can be released. It is the void of the um, East, Eastern traditions, as in Hindu, Buddhism, okay? There is a complete correlation to enter the vacuum in the way that they knew how to do it thousands of years ago in order to bring about health and healing and happiness to those people present. So though I said it was a purification, it is also a healing ceremony. People go in and they come out changed. Okay, they go in one way and they come out another way. The gift of ceremony, why I I am a ceremonialist. I will not say I'm a shaman. I will not say I'm a scientist, because I'm not. Totally not. I will claim that I'm a ceremonialist, because um, there is something deep that I really understand about how to bring change, not only for an individual in healing, but also for um, the world. And where there is ceremony that actually anchors and hooks itself into the very physical physics of where we are and who we are, that is what brings real genuine change, especially as the ceremony is constantly connected to this. So it's, it's feeding like a feedback loop. When here, what I was taught is, is where you can feel the creator breathe in and breathe out. There are two forces, as far as they're concerned, that we need to pay attention to. The breath in, by us is gravity. And the breath out, communicating back, is electromagnetism. Remember, electromagnetism is something very important to each one of you in this room with healing. And um, so ceremony to me does this beautifully, does it very openly, does it in a very contained way that really then actually feeds creates roots and feeds anchor and feeds change. Now what matters in here, and please, this is essential to you as healers, is the integrity of the intent. Healing, if you're the one that the person is arriving at with whatever it is that they have come with that they're saying is messing, is, is challenging their life, messing with their life, making it not so that they can't be in, this is, this is called resonance. Right? And you're listening and you're looking and you're from your place of expertise, you are um, intuitively and also in practical physical ways coming up with various solutions or various prescriptions for how if, if they follow a certain procedure they, they could actually experience great change. And this is based on your experience, it's also based on what you've learned, etc., etc., etc. What really matters more than anything, more than anything, is your intent when that person comes in the room. 
Is that intent from ego? If so, none of this exists. It becomes a false bubble of illusion, which hopefully one day will pop. The intent. One of the reasons why some of the Western ways have gotten um, the, inf the, the sacred information has gotten a bit messed up <laughs> is because someone realized the huge power in here. Infinite power. We just did that exercise to take you to the source of infinite power, which is inside each one of you, not just once, infinite times. You actually, each one of us is holding that capacity of power of the universe. We just haven't learned how to get it out. Integrity, integrity is everything. The desire to, um, there's only, one of the things that's also common in indigenous teachings is there's only one prayer, and it's for the health and happiness of another. It's not about saying what they should do or how they should do it. It's about health and happiness. It's our birthright. So what's in between this individual? And I will go even further in my healing work, because I do have a healing practice, is we're not separate. Therefore, if you're coming to see me, what's going on inside of me that I perceive you to even have this illness, quote, unquote? Because there really is no such thing. So I'm realizing I'm not a saint. I'm not there. <laughs> I'm like the rest of us, right? We're all clambering around the best we can. But if I treat you as I would treat myself, and together we work at understanding what is separating us from this beautiful resonance, it's not that I'm going to take her medicine, right? There's a different, I have a different intent and a different attitude when that person comes in, which is I don't know more than she does. But together, because it's happened that we've met in this way with this intention over it, with the described role, okay, I have, I trust explicitly in the present moment, in the present resonance, that that solution will arise out of the two of us being together. It's not me. And that's when true healing occurs. And it also occurs for you. The side, the side benefit, it also happens for you. And so I'm gonna open it up to questions at this point in time. Yes. So one prayer for health and happiness of other people, that means because you will want everything you, in order to pray for yourself. Or well, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be for yourself, as you pray for others. You pray for others, we don't know what they need. So health and happiness. If the person, if your, if your aunt that you're praying for is through your prayer, the prayer is informing the vacuum. And the vacuum is giving you the is, is bringing the solution or bringing the result into your life. I wish it was explicitly simple that, that you know we wouldn't be here if it was that simple, because the vacuum contains everything that anyone's ever thought. Right? It's it's the whole experience of the universe. We're feedback loops for this. So when we pray for health and happiness, then it can come down in a way that's more suited to that individual than we could possibly ever know. It is not for us to, if we go up here and, and implant our will, what we want to see, what we want to happen, it can get um, fairly tricky. What's one of the examples? Oh, um, this man, um, his uncle's, an, un, uncle's drinking too much. This would be a common reservation story. <laughs> oh, my uncle's drunk, drinking too much, and so they, they do a ceremony to wish their um, uncle and they for some reason instead of praying for health and happiness they go we want our uncle to stop drinking he's killing himself it's that drink I know it is just get rid of the drink we'll be all okay the next day they get a call and uncle's in prison where he's definitely removed from all the alcohol it's not necessarily the best environment <laughs> okay health and happiness might have come up with a very different solution For ourselves, there's much more, we call it, um, in indigenous form, you, when you do this, you say you're talking to your relatives. 
because um, we know that, you know, I'm not getting into all of that today. <laughs> There's a sort of stratosphere here where, the at where in the atomic level the relatives still exist. So you talk to your ancestors. And we said, we go talk to our relatives. And then we talk about sitting down at the table, having a conversation like you would with your best friend. So out it all comes in any kind of way. But whenever you're here, you're in the megaphone. You're in, you're in creation. You're the source of creation. You're in it all. And creation is creating itself all, every day. It's kind of, I watch the volcanoes. They show you that, especially the ones in Hawaii and um, Iceland, where new earth is forming the whole time. It's constantly unfolding. That's what's happening with you there. Yeah. Um, is there a difference going to that vacuum space as an individual or in the communal sense? The more you do it in community, the greater the result for you personally. And that's been proven time and time again with prayer, right? But if you have the prayer with this kind of focus, intent and focus is everything, and that's all spiritual training is about. It's about developing your spirit, is developing your intent and focus to be like an arrow and to not be distracted and pulled off. Does that answer your question? Okay. Who is your most influential spiritual teacher in your life? Oh, I've been so fortunate. Um, the most power, the one that really taught me about this in power is uh, Wallace Black Elk, who I had the good fortune of training with very directly and very personally for about six years. Um, otherwise, it's just who I meet on the road. We're all, you know, it's like. Um, the other, my godmother was very influential for me, but she's no longer around. He's no longer around. My elders have gone <laughs> in that sense. And then I have um, another elder I'd mentioned, actually, is Alberto Rivera, who's uh, from the Maya and is from Yucatan. And he was the one that. Um, the first time I met him, uh, it was right after the tsunami, and he takes me upstairs with several of us upstairs to um, in the house that he lived in the jungle outside of Jijian. And he was so excited, he was so excited. He's coming look, coming look. He has all these telescopes because the Mayans watch the stars. They watch the stars because they know everything out there is also what's happening in here. And so they watch the stars, telescope, and he says, "Look at this! Look at this!" And he's like really excited. We go, what, what, what? He says, look, the Earth axis has actually moved. Mm. And we went, oh, what does that mean? What's going to happen? He says, I don't know. <laughs> Just the axis has moved. <laughs> and um, the work, I didn't do extensive work with him. Again, that was more of an osmosis. As I said, I, I don't know where that comes from or how that works exactly. But he was the one that um, really moved me into doing a big ceremony that I do every year called the Night Turtle Dance. And he was the one who just sort of said, I don't want to see you again until you've done it. Start the talk, do it. And I did. He crossed. It wasn't fair. <laughs> yes? What do you think um, the correlation between Qigong and the electromagnetic field? Ah, uh, uh, great uh, question. Like Qi and Prana, is that all just like different? <laughs> Qi different and Prana is this, is resonance. Same. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, and we work it through the spine. That's that's our, you know, that's how we work it. Remember, everything is inside of you. Everything your human body is has the intelligence to create. And as much as we can, as healers, it's allowing. It's what is what you can do to open the body to doing what it needs to do and getting out of its way, getting out of this thing's way, so it can continue. Qigong is um, what. Here's what I love about Qigong: is we all have a strong magnetic field, correct? Mm -hmm. Around us, that's the heart's pattern is the same as the pattern around the earth, etc., etc. Qigong enlivens the whole energetic field, right? Cleanses it, purifies it, gets it moving. It's a beautiful, beautiful practice because when the energetic space is clear and clean, then the chakras begin to open up and then, right? <laughs> it's a beautiful practice. It's one that I really highly recommend over meditation, over everything. Yes, you think it's kind of just expressing the same phenomenon in different terms? Yes, it's doing it in a very physical way. Yeah. All those old practices, they're all based on this one, you know, when it all comes down to it, we're all, it's always being said, the same thing's being said again and again. 
the change is right now is our mythology is science. That's the mythology we live in. And so the science now, our, you know, our mythology is growing to be able to incorporate these, these sayings in a way that our brains go, oh, okay. And it unlocks it within the vocabulary of our time differently. We might have great romance around sun, dust, and stones. And for some of us, that might do it. But when we're needing and requiring a consciousness change way beyond that, those words work for many more people. And let's open the doors and let's move into a new way of seeing ourselves. Let's go way beyond flat earth to round earth. Let's become the cosmic light beings we are here to be and clear and cleanse ourselves on a daily practice. I do believe in meditation for about five minutes a day, which is to get into the still place. That's why I love Qigong, because it cleanses, purifies, charges up the physical space, and then you're still. But if not five minutes of meditation a day, just even the one that we just went through, going, getting connected to that proton inside of you, the inside, inside, inside. If you do that just a few minutes a day, and the other thing I'm well known for is the bathroom break. <laughs> I'm a great one for just heading to the bathroom when I need to recenter. <laughs> Something I can do in the middle of a big, big, big conversation, big discussions. I can always say, excuse me, I've got to pee. And I may not. I just might just really connect and center myself and get reconnected and then move out in the world. Used to be that uh, spiritual people, the spiritual people were separated from everyone else, right? They did the monastery, they did the cave, they did all those things. That's not what's being required today. What's being required today is we walk in the world with this as part of us. It's not separate. There is no separation between spirituality and science. It's just we're trying to learn how to articulate in a way that we can all be on the same page. We're on the same page, then it will be. Because we will have a <coughs> just all goes hand in hand. And you're all, every one of you in here is part of that major change, otherwise you wouldn't be here schooling here. So you are already, your mission somehow is caught up in changing consciousness. And um, changing consciousness about healing is huge because we have a lot of toxicity that we have accumulated that does need to be transformed and transmuted as fast as we can. And you're all part of that change. You've all chosen to do this. So I am very excited to be here. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs>